Over the next 30 minutes, we will spend time talking to Shiv Sagal, Chief Product Officer. As Chief Product Officer, Shiv helps the world's leading media companies adopt new business strategies. Most recently, he conceived and led a team to launch RSG's audience platform. Shiv will talk about RSG's journey in evaluating several platforms and explain ultimately why they chose Snowflake. The key question Shiv had, as was I'm sure many of you on the line have, is how do we scale our platform as we face increasing demand for data, deeper analytics, and demand for more users, all while maintaining financial stability? And I'm Jeannie Liu. I'm a product marketing manager at Snowflake. I'll be the moderator for today's session. As always, live questions will be asked at the very end, uh, but please feel free to type them in throughout the duration of Shiv's talk. Please ask any and all questions because no question is off limits. Shiv, without further ado, off to you. Thank you, Janie, and thank you, Zoe, and, and uh, thank you, Snowflake, and, and for all of you uh, listening. And uh, I thought, so we're going to spend some time, I know about 10, 15 minutes, um, but what I would really like to share with you guys about our story is really the theme of doing, uh, the art of doing more with less. And as machine learning and AI has become a hot topic and a hot button across all industries, I thought I would just share a little bit about what's happening in the media and entertainment space and, and how are we leveraging these technologies that have been around actually since the 1990s when it comes to machine learning and, and uh, uh, mathematically they've been around longer, but I thought it would be interesting just to share a little bit about where our industry is, what we do, and, and how do we do it with Snowflake and the value that we provide to our clients. So this slide, the future of tele television, this is just our warm-up slide because the answer could be anything. It could be what is the future of television, more RSG software, or more Snowflake databases or more people attending the webinar. But really, the, uh, all jokes aside, the future of television is something that's widely debated as there's a shift in consumer behavior and their viewing patterns, which is uh, challenging the traditional businesses. Meanwhile, we're seeing the rise of over-the-top companies and folks like Netflix and Hulu and uh, you know, other over-the-top platforms. And uh, where the industry is today is actually uh, kind of mimicking a, an awkward family tree where all these companies were once related, now they're you know, merging and joining back up. And, and really, uh, I think it's, it's telling where the industry is that in order for the traditional players to remain competitive, they really have to join forces with their competitors in order to compete with the folks that are here on the bottom right, which is the Apples, Amazons, Google, and Facebook. And if you can see these various players that are within the media and entertainment space, there's a relationship between so many of these organizations, and it's uh, you know, really a, a telling of the industry as I really find it to be more like the wild, wild west now. And I say that uh, in all seriousness because I firmly believe that, that we have to remind our clients sometimes in terms of what are their goals as an organization. And from a business perspective, I believe uh, uh, media companies should be focused on evaluating what is their core content portfolio and understanding that core content portfolio as it relates to their target audience and measuring the feedback loop between, you know, what is the affinity or what's the engagement of their core audience to their core content portfolio. And especially in today's day and age where it's this attention economy, right, are you able to keep and hold those audiences over time? And, and I believe that, that this is one aspect that many of our companies our clients are struggling with, that consistent feedback loop to ensure that there's that level of engagement that they might expect uh, throughout the course of you know, the, the life cycle of a uh, some piece of content or franchise. And on the technology side, you know, this is actually our core key question you know, that really drove our adoption of Snowflake. But we're seeing many of our clients also with technology and data science teams. And, 
everyone's kind of trying to figure out the same problem is that there's all this data. You know, how do we make it accessible and dem democratize those insights across the organization while ensuring that everybody gets the right information and, and we're not breaking the piggy bank? And this is the art of doing more but less because as we have experienced firsthand, just because you're in the cloud doesn't mean that you're getting optimal uh, performance. It also doesn't mean that you're, that you're uh, being cost effective. And uh, similarly, uh, w when it comes to our clients, just because we have these tools at our disposal doesn't mean, and, and I apologize if the for formatting is a little off, but just because we have these technologies, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden we can, you know, create models for, you know, audience pit targeting. It doesn't mean we can do all these attribution models and forecast, you know, uh, audiences in the future and, and kind of optimize how many ads and promos to play. Uh, because there really is a revenue stream revolution, and if you look at companies like video game companies that have been nimble and are able to move to new approaches and to, to sell their content. Uh, we have traditional media, cable, and broadcast companies that are really uh, um, uh, unable to really explore because they're trying to figure out why are content ratings down. And that, con that question has be uh, gotten so much more complex as the industry is built on Nielsen data and there could be a change to the sample, there could be a change to audience viewing behaviors, there can be all these different reasons why network ratings are down. And that's where RSG Media comes in because we have uh, products that are catered to all three inventories in the media and entertainment space. And there's only three cookie jars. You have your rights, you have your marketing, and you have your advertising. And we actually have the RSG audience platform, which uh, is what I head up, and it actually intersects with all three inventories. And I'll explain why and, and how we do that. But I really believe that uh, in today's day and age where there's so much opportunity, our clients are really uh, left uh, kind of fighting these legacy issues. And it's our job first to ensure that we can get them uh, uh, their head above the water to run the day-to-day -day business and then focus on the strategic nature of things, which is, if I learn to hit the arrow, what I call driving the car, ultimately at, from an analytics perspective, to make an impact to our clients or cable and broadcast network studios, MSOs, MVPDs, we need to ensure that we are driving their content, audiences, and revenues. And how are we doing that? That is through our new platform where we are understanding what it means to be cloud native. And, and there's a, a great white paper from a gentleman, his name is O'Reilly, and it really talks about what do you need, what, what is a modern technology platform, and what are the approaches. And just for example, and I want to be mindful of time, just the concept of load balance servers uh, uh, versus those servers that, that are scalable in nature. Right, they both provide the same uh, 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 approach and benefit, but one has two servers, one has one server, and, and spending that money appropriately. And what we try to do is to educate our clients across the technology and the business side, where we try to ensure that under the hood we address all of the uh, nitty-gritties and we just allow our clients to focus on what they have to do, which is to analyze the uh, uh, the, the media landscape and understand how does their content resonate with the core audiences and how do they position themselves best. And ultimately, our clients are researchers and they are storytellers. And what we try to do is just simplify everything. So if we kind of read things from right to left, kind of like uh, uh, how the, uh, I believe it's the Chinese and Japanese, however they read, we just want our clients to focus just on the right-hand side, which is the users. And everything from the users to the data is what our platform addresses uh, um, and just makes things easier. And I'm going to speak to this in, this, uh, uh, in a second. I just want to be mindful of time, as I mentioned. And, and, and uh, what I want to do before we get to the technology side of things is just give everyone a quick sense of what we do and of what we 
of the value that we provide for our clients. And, and uh, there's a shift not only in consumer behavior, but also in how people are running their businesses. And if we can ensure that our insights are not only engaging, but our platform allows people to explore where they can understand for, uh, this is all about movies. And this is actually a, a regression model. But if we take a step back and if we want to understand who are movie viewers, you know, movie viewers is actually an interesting use case because t uh, heavy movie viewers are actually daytime movie viewers. And they watch roughly three times more movies than your typical movie viewer. And they actually watch a lot more TV than you'd expect. And heavy movie viewers are typically females who over both African-American and non-Hispanic, and are typically older. And for these movie viewers, we see that 48% of them actually have a household size of about four. Females have a greater uh, uh, average audience. Uh, there's more females watching movies, and they have a greater share across all day parts than men. And romance, suspense, and children in movie genres are displayed the highest engagement levels and over-index. And just by way of example, uh, these insights come into play when people want to understand, hey, what is the best action movie to play on my network? Well, the number one rated movie by gross rating points was uh, a couple years back, Transformers, Age of Extinction in 2017, Q4. For children movies, Elf was the top movie, Despicable Me 2 uh, was the second top movie. But just to pull these insights and to layer it on top of, Hey, what are the top keywords that are associated to top performing movie titles? Uh, all of a sudden, we're able to quickly understand the dynamics of movie viewers in the TV uh, uh, viewing universe. And, and these are d additional insights from the modeling side. And uh, just to be mindful of time, I just want to show you guys one last thing, which is uh, ultimately a maturity curve. If we can help our clients understand, hey, if network ratings were down, how do we ensure that this does not happen again? Let's track the ratings. Let's track the people who stopped watching our network. Let's understand who they are. Let's understand their viewing behaviors and ultimately get to programming suggestions and changes to their marketing strategy. Well, now we have a more, much more nimble organization uh, and it's all about being responsive to data, managing the data, processing the data so that the organization and the business folks can be a little bit more nimble. And, and I've kind of haven't talked about Snowflake and technology the whole time, but that is the goal from my perspective. Uh, we want to have technology be seamless and really integrated and harmonize those technologies and those benefits throughout the platform where folks don't really realize right, that what we might be using under the hood. And, and if we can kind of gear towards this new era where we are allowing folks to explore and uh, allowing folks to really start to ask the questions that are strategic in nature uh, and, and take away the burden of just running the same reports each and every day, um, that is, you know, what our, our goal and initiative is. And, and we have specifically uh, evaluated uh, Snowflake, IBM, AWS, Oracle, MySQL, all these different technologies. And, and right now, Snowflake is not only the most cost-effective technology, it's also the most performant, fastest, and most reliable, as well as those other features that, uh, for Snowflake that really speak to this new era of analytics and insights in the media industry, which is starting to share data and share insights. So um, I hope that was a helpful 10, 15, a uh, quick 10-minute overview on the industry and what we do and where things are. Um, and I'll uh, uh, kind of leave it for some questions. Excellent. Thank you, Shiv. And thanks for that intro about the media industry. So it sounds like you guys are definitely well-versed in, uh, in that space. So this, these questions come from people who are in a similar space. And uh, I'll start off with this particular question. Uh, it, it's about what other data platforms did you re research before you decided to choose Snowflake? And why did you mm -hmm. ultimately choose Snowflake? Sure. So 
our uh, uh, experience with snowflake actually stems about two, three years back, and it's interesting. Uh, the same also goes for Spark. A couple of years ago, uh, uh, Spark, uh, through uh, whether it's the Databricks platform or any other platform, wasn't able to handle our use cases for data ingestion and processing. Now, Snowflake at that time was also a, a, a little, uh, 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 there were new players in the market and, and we were unsure if we were able to rely on the ability to uh, manage the workflow between data processing and transformation while also supporting uh, our user base. So we actually have a database on a 1.0 platform that is supporting the data processing, the data transformation, and supporting uh, over 600 users uh, to run reports. And we would come into concurrency problems. We would come into uh, peak uh, uh, demand problems where, hey, we know every day we're getting 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and 4 o'clock, we're getting data. And our users would always experience uh, uh, degradation when it comes to performance. So we actually, uh, through the years, have uh, compared IBM's Dash DB to Redshift, uh, uh, as well as other AWS offerings. Uh, we have done everything from server list or Redshift to uh, uh, IBM offerings, and, and, and we have evaluated Snowflake, and, and the, uh, I honestly believe that IBM DashDB is a great database and one of the most powerful databases our organization has leveraged for years. However, Snowflake is, a, uh, is, is probably a tenfold more performance. Something that will take one minute will actually take 20 seconds in Snowflake, and we're crunching 50,000 viewers. They're viewing behaviors minute by minute and understanding their propensity to tune in at 9.36 in the morning. You know, so uh, uh, for us, that's been our story, and we have compared all these technologies, and, and the harmony between Snowflake and Databricks is also something that's very important just because you have a great database, but if it doesn't connect to the API and the UI, then, you know, the data, the database is kind of meaningless. So the harmony between Snowflake and Databricks was also a driving cause to adopt it. Uh, um, and I hope that's a helpful background in terms of at least our experience. That's super helpful, Shiv, and I like that metric that you threw out. So one minute that would have taken uh, to run in IBM took 20 seconds in Snowflake, so that uh, decrease in, in time has been probably very valuable for you and for all the users of the data. As a follow-up, yeah. there's um, a lot of similar questions that we get, and it's basically about performance benchmarking. And I know that's a dicey subject because you don't want to disclose or you, your company does not want to disclose the, the previous date, but if you could just provide other insights. So this was a great example that you showed, uh, but other insights into how, what other dimensions of performance were you looking at? So for me, uh, running a business uh, our goal up front was to have a multi-tenant platform. And for the media industry, we have a unique, uh, 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 we're in a un unique position because the U.S. market is based on, the currency is Nielsen data. So everyone has Nielsen data, right? Uh, they're not getting any different Nielsen data than anyone else. So for us to, to, to um, be able to, uh, uh, support a large user base, and we're talking uh, at, at, at across two clients by itself, we're, we're already at 500 users. And the type of insights that they're pulling is, is tracking people minute by minute, and, and then there's the whole data science arm uh, of things, but we're really slicing and dicing and segmenting viewers and clustering them together and from indexing one set of viewers to another set of viewers. And this is where concurrency testing comes into play because we, we need to ensure that those type of deep insights, and again, uh, our end users are storytellers. So to craft a story, there's a lot of you know, uh, data points that go in, uh, together. So if we can have concurrency testing uh, to ensure that we can support 500 plus users, that we can ensure 
that there is no degradation in performance during ETL uh, uh, activities. A and if we scale our, our technology stack, can we scale up and scale down accordingly? These were our high-level requirements. Um, and, and concurrency was one of the big drivers that we keep on mentioning. But uh, uh, for me, it's the seamless nature of things where if we can ensure a seamless experience to our users, doesn't matter where they are, whenever they are, we need to have access transparency for them uh, uh, to see their information, but to also ensure that there's no diminished experience. So that's a, a long-winded answer, but, but I hope it helps uh, shed some light in terms of what our uh, 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 metrics were to you know, uh, ultimately invest in a new technology. Absolutely, Shiv, and I like that uh, reference to ensuring a seamless experience and that also includes transparency. Uh, what better way to do that than with more data? Similar to the question that I asked before, this question is about tools and other platforms. So just imagine that you have your ingestion of data on the left-hand side with your ELP and EPL partners, and you have Snowflake in the middle, and then you have your analytics on the right-hand side. This question mm -hmm. is talking about what are, you using, what are you guys using specifically on the left-hand side, and what are you guys using on the right-hand side, so data integration, visualization, et cetera? Sure. So uh, the uh, data ingestion uh, transformation, and, and I call it fusion because we are actually fusing multiple data sets together. Uh, just for everyone's uh, 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 reference, one movie on uh, one network will be called something completely different on another network, and it's the same movie. So in order to pull, you know, if we need to forecast Billy Madison, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, well, we need to get all the historical runs from Billy Madison. So we need an ETL uh, uh, tool, uh, but also the ability to transform and fuse that data as we're processing the data. So we are leveraging Databricks Delta for that process. Now, Databricks and Snowflake, uh, I can't talk, I mean, it's a beautiful thing that when something is, is, is in harmony and in sync with uh, each other. Uh, the integration between Databricks and, and Snowflake is really important to us as that's when uh, our users will experience a degradation if we're processing, you know, a, a lot of, you know, a week's worth of data. Uh, Nielsen provides data each and every day, and, and Tuesdays are the worst because it's all the catch-up, and Nielsen will also say, hey, by the way, we made a mistake, right? So the ability to go uh, uh, update data appropriately as well uh, so that's where uh, Databricks and Snowflake come into place. The data lake is, is Databricks. The data warehouse is Snowflake. Uh, we have our, uh, our apps that are built. Uh, we're leveraging Node.js on the API side, and, and everything that you're seeing on the UI side is all uh, uh, custom built, and we're leveraging D3 and, and a slew of other libraries, uh, including high charts, for example. But... Uh, uh, yeah, um, making things looking, you know, to make things look good, to make it look modern, you know, even that's a, a, a value add uh, as the industry has been quite outdated in terms of new tools. So uh, uh, I can provide uh, to Janine and, and uh, Zoe as well a kind of a, a one pager of all the different technologies that we have. But uh, one thing, just a very granular thing to call out, we used to have a, a Redis to cache all the data each and every day so that when people log into the application first thing in the morning, you have the core basic things pre-cached. Uh, uh, that intelligent caching doesn't happen anymore. And, and that's what happens. You know, like We were investing in technology just to ensure some level of stability. Well, now we have decreased the level in, of investment, but increased the platform stability. So uh, that ETL and, and data warehouse uh, uh, harmony is, is very important for us. And I keep on using that word harmony, but uh, I hope you guys start to take away that it's important. <laughs> Absolutely, Shiv, and I like that offer to just see all the different vendors and partners that you're using because, as you know, Snowflake works with multiple vendors across a wide range of capabilities, so it would be interesting to see um, your ecosystem. 
One related question to that is about volume. So I know you are probably not in a position to disclose, but uh, just directionally, how much are we processing a day? Are we in the tens sure, of petabytes? Sure. Petabyte? No, <laughs> um, we are not processing petabytes of data. We are processing gigabytes of data, and we're talking about within one day, you know, uh, um, ballpark, let's just say two to uh, five gigs a day on average. Um, now, despite the fact that we don't have this volume of data, and by the way, we processed Nielsen data uh, from September 2014 to date, and storage today in today's day and age is not the issue. It's the compute power. Right. But the compute power required to process Nielsen data, to transform it, and to get extract insights out of it takes a tremendous amount of computing power. And, 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 and again, traditional databases, even though they're massive parallel processing or you know, can handle multiple computations at once, inherently traditional databases still skew the majority of their compute power towards uh, supporting one task. Right, they're, they're still going to be biased in nature, and and it's because of the amount of computations that has to happen to just transform the Nielsen data. That's where we were feeling all of our pain, and 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 uh, again, the pain would be subsided if Nielsen didn't deliver data in like you know file delimited 1950s old school file formats. But uh, that's the nature of the beast, and, and kind of that's kind of what we were facing there. Um, so that's uh, uh, kind of what was uh, going on under the hood, and I kind of lost track of uh, my train of thought, but I hope that answered the question. Yeah, absolutely. So directionally, it's, it's gigabytes, and that, that's uh, good to know. Uh, in terms of how you're using, uh, so you talked about a lot of the data that you do pull from is if you market data is on, is on Nielsen. So I think this is a, just a curiosity question come from the audience. Um, how do you actually know when somebody tunes into a particular program? And you said that the movie, although it's the same movie, it may be called something else in a different network. So how do you resolve all these incongruities? So that is actually the most fun part. If we can ha keep our clients happy, and if we can keep our platform up and running, then we have an opportunity to do something that no one else has done yet. And I'll tell everybody our secret up front. The industry in the media and entertainment space here in the U.S., as well as most other markets, is sample-based data. So Nielsen has a panel of 50,000 people. And for those 50,000 uh, 50, households, right, we have each and every person within the sample, what they watch, who they are, and some uh, 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 you know, uh, attributes about them. And, and we, we can money ball the Nielsen sample. Right? We can say that we want to target a specific type of person. Uh, I'm looking at a PowerPoint right now. It is called the Nick Super Pids Kids. And there's a six-year-old who represents 10,248 people. This six-year-old really, really likes SpongeBob, and she does not like Disney and Cartoon Network. So she is an outlier, but she represents a lot of people. And if we could just target her and keep her on Nickelodeon, then uh, you know we have, uh, you know, in, we will be increasing network ratings by keeping that viewer there because she statistically has a large significance, and that's the nature of sample-based data. Um, however, uh, Nielsen is just one of many data sets, uh, and we're, I'm specifically focusing on linear, uh, but we have over 50 APIs across linear and nonlinear data sets. Uh, however, Nielsen's uh, uh, all-minute respondent-level data is the true, uh, uh, you know, uh, holy grail. Uh, if, if, if folks can understand the complexity of the data and start to behaviorally target people, uh, that's where I see uh, you know, um, new value uh, when it comes to analytics in our space. I hope that helps. 
so that was super right and especially to hear about uh, the demographics of um Oh, we know everything about this one, lit, you know, six-year-old. She is in a Hispanic household, single income, multi-dwelling family who's renting in Bakersfield, California. Her mom and dad are taking turns in employment. They're living on 49K a year, as I mentioned. They don't have uh, uh, any cable, but they have their phones. And we have this whole story on a, on a family. Uh, and, and, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, and the psychographics play a huge part in how you're able to then use your analytics on top of that. So that's very interesting. Uh, a lot of questions have come in, uh, although we do have a stop, but I do want to get to a couple that were that you had mentioned before. So you talked about data sharing. Uh, are you leveraging data sharing today, or is that something that you guys have as a to-do slash project? So data sharing is something that we've done with specific clients uh, who also have Snowflake. And uh, I just want to call out that I you know, mentioned that the whole industry runs and operates on Nielsen data. July 15th, I believe, was when the New York City uh, uh, power outage happened. And ever since the New York City power outage, we have had uh, uh, connectivity issues with Nielsen. So all of a sudden, the whole industry is getting, you know, uh, is getting bogged down with server connectivity issues, which is uh, 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 making it hard for anybody to understand what happened on, you know, TV last night. And uh, that's where data sharing comes into play. Because if there's any issues that happens when it comes to making data accessible, whether it's through an FTP site or whether it's an API, right? And uh, if there's any issues, it's a beautiful fail-safe approach. And also, at the end of the day, whether it's sharing data or sharing notebooks, I mean, when it comes to analytics and research, that's what, that's what the nature of the business is. So we want to make it easy for people to get data and uh, and right now, processing the data is, is uh, I actually consider our understanding of the data as valued IP. And uh, so that's nice that we understand it, but now we need to make it and dem democratize that data across the industry as well as uh, our clients. And, and I believe the data sharing aspect of things just makes things so much more easier, uh, especially if there's a lot of massaging of data that has to happen. Super interesting, and I love the uh, the data sharing use case. So this question is in particular for the media industry, but it also comes in the context of ingesting data. So uh, this question in particular was referring to either streaming or batch loading. Do you see any trend from one to the other? Uh, and if so, why do you think that is? So the nature of how data is delivered to us uh, Nielsen, uh, so, so there is always a, a, a lag in the data. So we will, depending on the data set, it's either a one-day lag, a two-day lag. Actually, depending on the data set, it, it could even be a 40-day lag or a 50-day lag. Um, and uh, there is no streaming uh, and concept of streaming when it comes to these bigger data sets. Now, there's streaming of data, uh, for example, for devices. But the data that gets delivered, for example, to the Viacoms of the world is literally four or five columns. And four or five columns will literally say user ID, device ID, you know, uh, uh, two, you know session duration, uh, 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 a stream completion. You know, that's, there's not a lot of – so the most you could do is pretty much just say, you know, average time, you know, viewed for this program. Uh, and, and you cannot correlate that to – uh, linear viewing uh, uh, most of the time. So uh, uh, things that are streaming in nature are typical extremely simple uh, data sets that are no more than four or five columns, six columns. And uh, the real data that we have to work with is delivered in batch, and that's the where the, the, the processing and the logic and uh, the understanding of, of, you know, what that data is, how it's structured comes into play. And 
uh, in the industry, there's this old saying that's still relevant, linear dollars versus digital dimes. Even though uh, we're all watching content on our phones and, and whatnot, uh, ad dollars are still uh, uh, you know, strong on linear television. So uh, that is still very much the currency, and, and I don't foresee any shift happening. Uh, uh, when it comes to, you know, that data delivery aspect of things um, and, and how data is getting delivered to us. Very helpful, Shiv, to see the... Uh, the and it's, by the way, not just Nielsen. It is, you know, Kantar. It is Barb in the U.K., Abope in Latam. Uh, it's an industry issue that we have in terms of getting access to the data to run the business. So uh, if any of you guys are working at those companies, please help us. <laughs> uh, excellent. So I do want to wrap up, but let's get to this last question here because we've got a lot of these similar questions, and then um, we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day. Uh, so, you talked about data lake. So are you guys using Snowflake as your data lake uh, as well as your data warehouse today, or do you have a separate data lake where you're actually piping into Snowflake? Yeah, so Snowflake is actually our data warehouse, and it is running our heavy computations uh, 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 that we have, as well as light, con you know, just it's really supporting our, our application. Data Bricks is actually our data lake because we are processing the data uh, in Data Bricks, and then we're also, before sending it to Snowflake, doing one more layer of aggregations just to make things uh, uh, tune and tweak things appropriately for our applications. So depending on who the user is uh, and what the use case is, whether it's our client or whether it is us internally, we're either going to leverage the data lake if we need the, uh, uh, if we, you know, need to uh, mess around with the data a little bit, if we need to transform it, if we need the, you know, it in a little bit more raw nature. The data warehouse is where we have our happy, pretty, beautiful data uh, that's structured nicely so that it's easy for the users to view and consume and it's easy for our apps to crunch and turn out. That sounds great. Yeah, well, as you, as you talked about Harmony, uh, we work well with Databricks uh, and our partners, so good to see the, the partnership there. We are over time, uh, which goes to show you that there's a lot of interest. We still have a few questions to get to, and we'll have somebody to chat to every that has been able to get your question answered. Uh, we thank you, Shiv, for hosting this office hours and being uh, such a great speaker for us, and thank you, everyone on the line. We'll see you again at the next office hours in two weeks. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.